I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of information about the spatial overview as well as the temporal circumstances within the reproductive tract of Drosophila. The reproductive tract of Drosophila mainly contains two ovaries, which I attempted to draw here in red, as well as a little bit bigger, a little bit more detailed here in black. One such ovary contains basically about 16 to 20 ovarioles. So one such ovariole basically looks like this structure here. This ovariole contains two axes, a long axis and a short axis. The long axis has two very significant ends that are important spatially as well as temporally. So here we would have anterior and here we would have posterior. And if you imagine now turning these two ovaries just like I drew it here in red, then you would of course see that this axis here refers to the axis of the Drosophila motherfly, anterior and posterior. Like I said, the two ends are not only important spatially but also temporally. The anterior end refers to the beginning of oocyte development or oogenesis. That's where specific cells are located that we call germline stem cells, GSC. One such germline stem cell or in fact two to three germline stem cells, give rise to a whole aggregate of cells that we call germline cyst. Germline cyst. One cell of this germline cyst will be the oocyte. Later this germline cyst will be encapsulated by other cells, somatic cells, and we then refer to this whole aggregate of cells as egg chamber. The egg chamber is the entity that develops throughout the ovariole and its basic function is to produce a big cell, a giant oocyte with all the nutrients, with different membranes and also the anterior posterior axis as well as the dorsal ventral axis already defined. So this here would then be the oocyte. It is usually a little bit cucumber shaped and it contains two very important membranes at the end. So the inner membrane is the vitelline membrane and the outer membrane would be the chorion. So the main task of the aggregate of cells that we call germline cyst and later egg chamber is to produce one big cell, the oocyte. And that all happens concomitantly with the egg chamber moving from anterior to posterior. The anterior end is where everything begins, where the whole development begins and the posterior end is where the mature oocyte will hatch into the oviduct, which is called ovulation, and will then be fertilized and laid. So the main question we try to solve is what happens within the ovariole? How is it possible that one cell or two to three cells, the germline stem cells, are able to produce a whole aggregate of cells that we call germline cysts and later egg chamber that produces all the nutrients of the oocyte, all the membranes and even defines both axes of the oocyte. How is that possible? In order to be able to talk about it, we need to find a way to classify or divide different areas within the ovule. And that is commonly done by dividing it into 14 stages. So some of these stages are drawn here, so stage 1, 2, 4 and so on until 14. These stages are based on morphological differences. That means that they looked at one egg chamber, at the development of one egg chamber, and tried to understand or observe what changed over time morphologically. And of course that causes some problems when we talk about that, because we talk about molecular differences, not morphological differences. And that's sometimes a problem because not all molecular occurrences happen within a stage, but sometimes between stages or during many stages. However, one more thing worth mentioning is that not each stage of these 14 stages is occupied by one egg chamber all the time. That is because there are only seven to eight egg chambers usually developing simultaneously. And that is because each stage takes variable amounts of time and that of course would cause problems if the more posterior egg chamber would develop slower than the more anterior egg chamber. So I think the most important stage is stage 1. Stage 1 is so important because at one end, at the anterior end, the germline stem cells are located while at the other end, the posterior end, the whole egg chamber hatches into the rest of the ovariole. It is in fact so important that it got its own name and we call it the germarium.
is also subdivided into different areas that we call regions. So region 1 to A to B and 3. So do not confuse regions with stages. Stages refer to these 14 stages and regions refer to different areas within the gemarium. And of course, if we have a special name for one stage, we also have a special name for the other. And the other stages are usually called vitellarium. So vitellarium comes from vitellus, and vitellus means yolk in Latin. So that refers to the production of yolk, which happens or occurs within these stages, which is then called vitellogenesis. So now we know how to divide the ovule into stages and also into germarium or vitellarium. But there is one more way we can define different areas, and that is by early, mid, or late ogenesis. So early ogenesis goes from stage 1 to 6, 7 to 10 would be mid ogenesis, and 10 to 14 would be late ogenesis. So just that you're able to orient yourself a little bit timely, one egg chamber going through all these 14 stages takes about 10 days whereas basic embryonic development only takes one day. And that is also one reason why it comes in handy to study these developmental processes, because they take so much time that it is possible to observe them. Having explained the basic terminology of different things within the ovary so we're able to name it and to be able to divide different areas, we can now to go on to discuss what occurs within the ovary before we go on to how it occurs. So let's start with what occurs, and we'll start with the very anterior end. So here, or here, or here, or here. So this is also the germarium. So we'll start at the stage one, stage one or germarium, in region one. That's the very anterior end. And so I have drawn it here a little bit bigger. So this would be region one, this would be 2A, this would be 2B, and this is region three. So together, we call that stage one or germarium. And this would be already stage two here and so on. So this is the very anterior end. And at the very anterior end, we have two to three important cells here in orange that I already told you are called germline stem cells. So GSC. And one such germline stem cell will usually divide and give rise to another cell we call procystoplast. So procystoplast. So that division is then called an asymmetrical division, with one cell renewing the stem cell, while the other cell will be called the procystoplast. The procystoplast will then get a specific chain regulatory state and is then called the cystoplast and the cystoplast will then divide four times mitotically. So two cells, four cells, eight and sixteen. So if you count them you might notice that that are not eight and that are not sixteen and that is because I try to draw them a little bit more in 3D so you might imagine some cells behind these ones but these should be two, four, eight and sixteen. So what is also special about these four mitotic divisions is that they are incomplete. That is very important. That means that usually when a cell divides, just like here, this would be a complete division of the germline stem cell, there is a contractile ring which contracts and will pinch off these two cells so you have two single separate cells that are not connected. But later when this Procystoblast will then divide and create two cells, it will divide incompletely. And that means that the contractile ring will not contract fully and leaves a bridge or a tunnel or connection, however you want to call it, between these two cells here. And we call that the cytoplasmic bridge or ring canal. So these two cells are connected, the four cells are connected, the eight and the sixteen cells are also connected. And because they are connected, you could see it as one cytoplasm, one continuous cytoplasm. And whenever you have a continuous cytoplasm with many nuclei, you could call it a syncytium. So you could refer to the structure here as syncytium. 
And that is actually done in many studies. However, I think it's a little bit confusing for us because syncytium is here in the context of oogenesis. And later, when you study embryonic development of Drosophila, you'll see that you have also a stage that is called syncytium, and later on the syncytial blastoderm and then the cellular blastoderm. So you, you might confuse it with this syncytium here. Also, the syncytium in, in the embryonic development is one big cell, which is cucumber shaped, just like the oocyte, with many nuclei. But in this case, you more have many cells that are just connected. So it doesn't really look like one cell. It just looks like 16 cells that are connected. That's why it is usually referred to as just germline cyst. So this aggregate of cells is also called germline cyst. And then you might want to refer to single cells here within the germline cyst. And they are then called cystocytes. So I write that down here. Cystocytes. Cysto stands for germline cyst and site is always the suffix for cell generally. So cystocytes means it's the cell of the germline cyst. So let's look a little bit more closer at these 16 cells here. Region 2a begins as soon as you see this 16 cell germline cyst. And what, what I also tried to draw here are these two red cells. Two of these 16 cells will express different markers than the other 14. These markers are just RNA or protein that can be seen by scientists that are expressed in these two cells but not on the other 14. And these markers are proteins or RNA specific for meiosis and for oocyte development. And that's why we call these two cells Proocytes. So we'll have two proocytes, and the other 14 are called pro nurse cells. These two cells, these two proocytes, will enter meiosis and will in fact go until the synaptonormal complex of prophase 1 of meiosis 1. In region 2p, as we see, there is only one cell in red because one cell of these two until region 2p will exit meiosis and will continue as a nurse cell while just the other cell, so one of these two cells, will continue as the oocyte. So in region 2b, we then have one oocyte and 15 nurse cells. One thing I'd like to mention is what the nurse cells do. So the 15 nurse cells that we have in region 2b here in violet, just not to be confused. The 15 nurse cells will produce RNA, will produce proteins and organelles and ship them into the oocyte here in red. And that happens throughout all these stages here, but rather slow. But at stage 10, something special occurs, which we call nurse cell dumping. We'll come back to that. But nurse cell dumping is basically that all these RNA, protein, and organelles are shipped into the oocyte now way quicker than before. And nearly the whole cytoplasm of these nurse cells is dumped into the oocyte within 30 minutes, which is really, really quick comparing to the whole oogenesis, which takes 10 days. And that we call nurse cell dumping. And at the end of nurse cell dumping, all these 15 nurse cells will die by apoptosis. So the only remnant of this 16 cell germline cyst is the one oocyte at the end. Now we know that within region 2B, the oocyte is selected. But of course, as you can see, other things occur too. So let's start with region 2A again. We have here the 16 plaque cells that we call germline cyst. When we look at region 2b, the germline cyst is here drawn in violet. So not in black anymore, but violet, so different colors. That's really important. The germline cyst here has a different shape than in region 2a. It is, instead of here, like an aggregate of cells, it's here disc-shaped. And the reason why it's disc-shaped is because it's now encapsulated by other cells. So this encapsulation exerts a force on the germline cyst that leads to a disc-shaped germline cyst. So it's encapsulated within region 2b by these plaque cells. 
Remember? We talked about the germline cyst later forming the egg chamber. And that's exactly what occurs here. The germline cyst is encapsulated by these cells and is then called the egg chamber. So beginning with region 3, we first call this aggregate egg chamber and of course later on as well. These plaque cells surrounding the germline cyst also have a special name. They are called follicle cells. Follicle cells do not come from the germline stem cell here or from germline cells in general like the germline cyst does. They come from somatic cells. Somatic means soma or comes from soma and soma means body. So they are body cells. They come from uh, stem cells that are part of the body of the mother fly. They come from somatic stem cells and these somatic stem cells are in this case called follicle stem cells because they give rise to different follicle cells. So follicle stem cells are somatic stem cells. Just like we human beings have for example hematopoietic stem cells. These are also somatic stem cells that means they do not give rise to a whole organism but rather different cell types of a specific tissue or organ. In this case these stem cells give rise to different follicle cells. We have again two to three follicle stem cells just as we have before two to three different germline stem cells. These two to three different follicle stem cells are located between region 2a and 2b exactly at the border. So let's have a look what the follicle stem cells give rise to. The follicle stem cells give rise to two different groups. One group is called prepolar cells. Another name for prepolar cells would be polar stalk precursor. The second group is called epithelial follicle cells. These epithelial follicle cells then divide into terminal follicle cells and central follicle cells. And the terminal follicle cells again divide into anterior terminal follicle cells and posterior terminal follicle cells. So let's start with the prepolar cells or polar stalk precursors. So this group here is very important here in this germarium area. Both these cell groups, so polar stalk precursors and epithelial follicle cells, are generated here in region 2b. The prepolar cells or polar stalk precursors will migrate first here anteriorly of this germline cyst and posteriorly of the germline cyst. So there's a group here and here on these two poles next to the germline cyst. And because of that we can also name them by their migrating behavior as posterior migrating cells and because they migrate here across here so they are called cross migrating cells. So they're posterior migrating cells and cross migrating cells. So PMCS and CMCS. These two groups are really important because as the name implies they will give rise to polar cells and stalk cells and they will actually differentiate very early. So they will form these cell types very early. The epithelial follicle cells are the rest of the cells that encapsulate the, uh, the germline cysts. So around up here and down here and they will stay immature until stage 6 to 7, so all along here. So the first cells to, to differentiate are the polar cells and the stalk cells. So imagine the germline cyst here with all the follicle cells surrounding here will migrate from here from region 2p to region 3, so from here to here. And during that migration event the anterior polar cells will differentiate. So of course they are now located here because it moves here, so here are the polar, uh, the anterior polar follicle cells. And these other cells here that are also located here between different 
German cysts or egg chambers are also polar stalk precursors, but they're still immature. So the first one to differentiate are the polar cells and then the stalk cells. So here they're still immature, the stalk cells, and later on they're here mature and forming the stalk between different egg chambers. And the stalk is always formed from the older egg chamber to the newer egg chamber. So this egg chamber forms the stalk to this egg chamber, and this egg chamber forms the stalk to this, and so on. Of course, while moving always more posteriorly. So, we have this egg chamber in region 3, polar cells have differentiated, now the stalk cells differentiate, and while that occurs, this egg chamber hatches into the vitellarium, so from the germarium into the vitellarium, into stage 2, it will hatch into the rest of the ovariole and form the mature stalk here. So from here to here, while forming the stalk from these immature cells to these cells. So it moves one time over here. Now the stalk has formed and the stalk has two things that it does. First, as soon as the stalk is formed, it will have an effect on the newer egg chamber. The stalk will exert a force that leads to rounding up of the egg chamber, so it is now sphere-shaped instead of disc-shaped. The second thing the stalk does is it will lead to the oocyte moving more posterior. So instead of having a central position, now this egg chamber already has the stalk here, now the oocyte is posteriorly located. So now we discuss the polar and stalk cells. What about the epithelial follicle cells? They will stay immature, so they are around here and down here, and they will stay immature and proliferate five times, about five times, until stage six to seven. This is the stage where the epithelial follicle cells, or their precursors, will start to differentiate and stop to proliferate. And this is also called mitotic to endocycle switch. So they switch from mitosis to an endocycle. So they will replicate their DNA without actually undergoing cytokinesis. So they do not produce any other cells, but instead become polyploid. But in any case, they stop their mitotic behavior. They stop to uh, proliferate and will now start to differentiate into different cells. They will differentiate into terminal cells and central follicle cells, terminal follicle cells and central follicle cells. And that occurs by a very interesting mechanism. So you imagine having the two polar cells here. So we have two polar cells on each side. At the beginning, we had about three to five polar cells. So we can write that down here. Um, polar cells and stalk cells. We have about three to five polar cells, and later on we will have only two on each side. Stalk cells, so here in between, are about six to eight. Okay, so back to this picture. We have two polar cells on each side, so anterior polar cells and posterior polar cells, and they will now signal around them, making the follicle cells that receive this signal, making them terminal. Now, the cells that do not receive that signal are now central. So we have terminal follicle cells and central follicle cells. The terminal follicle cells are then again subdivided into anterior and posterior terminal cells. And that occurs by a second signal. So again, we have here two, the two polar cells. Then we have here anterior terminal. And posterior terminal needs a second signal. That comes from the oocyte here, making this one posterior terminal and by default, this one here is anterior terminal. So at the beginning, the oocyte is positioned asymmetrical on the posterior end. And as we'll see also inside the oocyte, 
components are distributed asymmetrically. They're also distributed uh, to the posterior side. They're shifted to the posterior side. This asymmetric uh, behavior is kind of an, a positional information that is transferred to the follicle cells by this asymmetric location of the oocyte. Now these follicle cells know that they are posterior, so they have this informational clue. And they will now signal back again to the oocyte with a specific factor that leads to cytoskeletal rearrangements that will then lead to the anterior posterior axis of the oocyte. So the cytoskeleton will be polarized with at one end more plus ends and at the other end more minus ends and whenever a molecule associates with a specific motor protein that will be shipped to one side preferentially. And that is the anterior posterior axis. And the second thing that occurs here is that not only the cytoskeleton is rearranged but also the nucleus of the oocyte will move from this posterior position within the cell to the anterior upper margin. So the nucleus will move from here up here. And then a specific signal is again going from here up to these follicle cells, to these central follicle cells, making these cells here ventral or dorsal, sorry, dorsal, and these cells here by default ventral. And then they will also again signal back to the oocyte, determining the dorsal ventral axis. So some other things that occur at the end here of these stages is on stage 8 we have vitellogenesis. So the production of yolk by follicle cells, so the follicle cells produce the yolk, is then exocytosed and endocytosed by the germline cyst and then shipped to the oocyte. So that is at stage 8. Beginning with stage 9 to about 12, the vitelline membrane is made. So that is in fact an actual topic that is studied right now. So how it is possible to produce the vitelline membrane around the oocyte or around the germline cyst while vitellogenesis is still occurring, while vesicles are exocytosed and endocytosed um, by follicle cells and germline cysts. So how does it work? Producing a membrane at the same time also shipping vesicles through it. So then at stage 10, we already talked about nurse cell dumping. Nurse cell dumping is, as we said, that all the nurse cells will undergo apoptosis and also ship all their cytoplasm or much of it to the oocyte. And at the end, at stage, or around stage 14, the chorion the outer egg membrane is produced. And then as the nurse cells undergo apoptosis and the outer membrane is produced, the oocyte will hatch into the oviduct, which is called ovulation, fertilized and then laid.